to the second uh, show of 2024 of the Rare Book Cafe, the Book Lovers Rendezvous. This is the Coffee Break Edition, and I got a Christmas present this year, a coffee mug with my co-host, Lee Lynn. Hello, Lee. Hi, Ed. It's good to see you. It's good to have you back in the country. Thank you. Thank you, Ridge Books, Calhoun, Georgia. My other co-host, Richard Morey. This <laughs> the big hand <laughs> uh, who's uh, spending the winter uh, snowbirding in Florida. Is that right, Richard? That's right. And guess what? I think I'm warmer than you, Ed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think we're both indoors, so probably the same temperature for right now. <laughs> and our guest this week, who hasn't been on the show for a while, but we're so happy to have him here because he's so knowledgeable. Larry Raykow of Wonderland Books in Cleveland, Ohio. Larry, aloha. Aloha, Ed. Yeah, Cleveland is uh, is actually maybe warmer than uh, than Florida these days. Uh, we have had one very small snowfall, and that's about it. We've had temperatures in the fifties and sixties, although right now uh, it's uh, it's getting to be winter here. Larry, we know that your specialization is children's books. And for some of the new listeners and, and listeners out there, I just want to thank you so much. We have had literally hundreds of people sign up uh, to, um, to follow the show in the last three or four months. So, Larry, share with us your CV, your CV a little bit and your, your history in, in, in this field of, 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 of excellence. Oh, I, I don't think it's all that different from so many of us who uh, who wound up as dealers, which is I really started by uh, by collecting. You know, I uh, I decided when my kids were very young, I was a uh, I was a administrator for a large uh, public library system. And uh, and I was in charge of selecting books for children for a while and uh, and and a pop up book. Uh, Jan Pekowski's uh, Haunted House came across my desk and I thought, ooh, my kids would really love this. And uh, they were at that point about four years old and six years old. And so I bought a copy and I brought it home and they did love it to death. I mean, within a week, it was torn apart and pieces were missing and the binding was broken and and I thought, gee, pop up books might be a fun thing to collect, you know, where I can keep them out of the hands of my own children. And so I started investigating the uh, the history of pop ups going all the way back. I mean, the pop ups that we know into the mid 18th and uh, 19th century or so, and uh, started collecting them and then got a duplicate and thought, oh, I can sell this duplicate to somebody and did. And use that money to buy more books. And now I have about 13,000, not pop-ups, but general, rare, and collectible children's books. And in wow, 13,000 books, but no more money. But no more money. No, 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 no. It's all in the books. That's what I tell my wife. Everything <laughs> is in the books. So, yeah, that's it. Um, I've, I started a couple of companies along the line, all of which dealt with noted children's illustrators. And uh, we created, oh, my gosh, uh, T-shirts and tote bags and book plates and all different kinds of wonderful stuff that we sold primarily to elementary school teachers and children's librarians and then at some point, I just said, I'd love to just immerse myself in the rare book world for the rest of the time I have. And so for the last uh, certainly 10, almost 12 years, that's what I've done exclusively. Yeah. Wow, you are a bibliophile entrepreneur. <laughs> thank you. That sounds much, much greater than I really am, but thank you. Now, Larry, on our last show, we, we talked to Lee and uh, Richard, who are going to be uh, showing at the upcoming Florida Book Fair on the March 1 through 3. I understand you're going to be there as well. I will as well. I, I was a regular there for a number of decades. And, well, first the pandemic hit, and then uh, I am the primary caretaker for an elderly relative. And so I've been 
staying pretty close to home, but I took a look at things this year and said, enough is enough. I really miss Florida and that show. And uh, so, yes, I'm really looking forward to it. We'll be driving down uh, just in time for the opening. Yeah. Pretty well, we're excited that you're coming. The, the uh, way you del- really are. Thank you, Lee. I'm really delighted also. Uh, um, why don't you share with us a few of the things that you're going to be bringing to the show? Yeah, you know, there's always so many and it's so much fun thinking about what to bring. But I, I just at random picked five items that might be might be of interest. This, you know, we all know Beatrix Potter, the creator of Peter Rabbit and so many other wonderful books for uh, children. This is uh, a first edition of the only almanac that she ever did, Peter Rabbit's Almanac for 1929, and it actually has the remnants of its original glassy dust jacket. I'll take that off for now. But uh, it's just a beautiful little book with uh, with Peter Rabbit on the front of it, and then lots of blank pages for the child to write about what they're going through. And then for each month, a wonderful picture of Peter Rabbit, his family and friends. And once again, this was 1929, the stock market crash. So not too many of these were distributed. And I won't say that it's as rare as, let's say, the first edition of Peter Rabbit, but it is way up there in terms of rarity for the uh, for Beatrice, uh, Beatrix Potter. And uh, I was just delighted to find a copy of this in such extraordinary condition, again, with some of the glassy and dust jacket. Well, I, let me um, ask you a quick question before you go on. Um, Great yeah. Britain, England has an amazing reputation for children and young adult books going back. Yes. And I'm sure before Alice in Wonderland, but that's the first that comes to mind. Yeah. Beatrix Potter, uh, C.S. Lewis, um, Harry Potter. Huh. How do the um, British authors compare to American authors with respect to children's books? It's an interesting question. And, uh, you know, there are obviously similarities, um, you know, and I, I see American artists. Now, I think of Trina Schardheimen, for instance, a, um, you know, a Caldecott winner and honoree many, many times. But her work um, obviously was uh, influenced by people like uh, like Rackham in England and uh, and others. And so, you know, I think there is a kind of British imaginative Great, that runs through a lot of their their fantasy and um, uh, work, but um, but that has been equaled in many ways in the United States, and I really see them as sort of congruent. Um, these these two really remarkable deep um, avenues of children's both writing and uh, and illustration. Yeah, thank you. Sure, um, you know I I, I referenced pop up for books earlier when we were talking. And this sounds like a plug for my business, but it truly isn't. I just happened to to grab this uh, Wonderland (laughs) Pictures. And uh, it is one of many uh, 19th and early 20th pop-up books and uh, movable books that I'll be bringing. And these are really just remarkable for any number of of reasons. Um, One of them, is just the amazing illustrations. Ooh. Kind of like a kaleidoscope. No, it, it, and it is, and it's important to remember that this was a point at which many optical toys, that is the Victorian period, was a period in which many optical toys appeared, uh, the magic lantern, the zoetrope, and so on and so forth. And the same kinds of mechanisms that were used in those optical toys were also used to a very great extent in movable and pop-up books. So there's a real connection between the two of those. And the other thing that's so remarkable about books like this is that this is now, what, a hundred and almost 30, a hundred and almost 40 years old. And the very fact that it was given to children to play with <laughs> and still survives and can make us go, ooh, that's really cool, is, I think, something incredible about children's books. And well, it's a, good, books it's a good thing you didn't give that one to your kids when you brought it home. 
That it is. That it is. Yeah. One of my favorite stories about my kids is that my, my daughter is two years younger than my, than my son. And my son was trained very well. And uh, he went up into uh, the shop one day and uh, when he was like four or five, maybe seven years old, and Rebecca was five. And he saw Rebecca taking books off the shelves. And he said, Rebecca, those books are not for reading. And uh, he was <laughs> he was right about that. I I trained him very well. Uh, you know, we also bring a lot of Caldecott and Newberry winners. For those who are not familiar with this, although I assume that the vast majority of your learned audience is, the Caldecott is given once a year by the American Library Association as the best illustrated book of the previous year. The Newberry for the best written book for children the previous year. And I thought this one was particularly apt to bring. This is Strawberry Girl by Lois Lenski, one of her regional novels. Um, Lenski is an interesting character. She uh, did a lot of work in the Northeast, but in part because of illness and in part because she enjoyed traveling, she and her husband would go in her somewhat later years down along the East Coast of the Southern States and uh, the more that she went down there, the more she realized that the various portions of the United States, the various regions, um, the children growing up really had different experiences than children growing up in other areas of the United States. And so she started to write her regional book. So the very first one um, was Bayou Suzette, based on an experience that she had in New Orleans. And this would go and tell the stories of individual children living in these specific areas of the country. The second one that she wrote was Strawberry Girl, and it wound up winning the Newberry for that year. And I think that it was particularly appropriate because this is the story of uh, Birdie Boyer, um, a young girl growing up in Florida during just the first time, really, that the state was being settled by non-Indigenous people. And uh, she and her family are strawberry farmers, but she just wants an education and she really wants to learn how to play the organ. So it is her story's family, both in terms of the regional farming that they did and also a young girl's aspiration. And I'm just pretty a, sure you won't be bringing that one home. I, I have a feeling perhaps not. I read you it know, for the first time you know, the other night. Yeah. It and is a cool book. It, it really is a cool book. And, you know, you're struck at reading a lot of things about Florida in that period. How did it ever get settled? <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it is. Difficult. It brings you right back how, to a certain place and time. Yeah. 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 It must and, have been. And, tough. and I recall I've read um, a number of Randy Wayne White's detective stories, you know, on the Gulf Coast of Florida. And and a lot of his descriptions, particularly of older places, in his books sound so much like descriptions of the places in the Strawberry Girl. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, there's another crossover between you know adult and juvenile fiction. Right. Um, you know, these are they're all mine in the same field. They really they really are. You know, um, Longfellow's Song of Hiawatha was uh, written in 1855 and had a remarkable impact. I mean, I think that poetry in the 19th century held a place that we can barely recognize today. You know, I mean, poets were like rock stars at that point. And, uh, and the Song of Hiawatha really influenced uh, both American poetry in the epic mode and uh, also has lived on, you know, and by uh, on the shores of Kichigumi, by the big lake shining water, and so on and so forth. And this influenced American culture and a recognition of Native American culture, perhaps not in the truest way, but uh, but in a pretty good way. Children's book. I have always been fascinated and have never shied away from um, from racist, um, uh, anti-religious, um, ethnic um, books that that present. Um, their subjects in uh, in a poor light. I think it's really important um, from Little Black Sambo on to have these books, to have them available, to be able to see 
the way that people treated others throughout the history of children's literature. And it makes us uncomfortable in the 21st century to encounter some of this. But in point of fact, I regard them at least as historic documents and, uh, and an insight into the way uh, the minds of our predecessors worked. Um, Great insight. Well, I, I, I always remember, you know, the, the song from South Pacific, uh, you know, you've got to be carefully taught. And this is the way that young children were introduced to African-American subjects, to Jewish subjects, to um, Italian and uh, and so on and so on. And oftentimes it was American to, to Native American. Absolutely. And uh, and this is the way that that young children's minds formed in terms of folks who were not like themselves, and often it was really in pretty horrible ways, which is an introduction. I'm sorry, but Richard? Well, Larry, before you move on, I just if yeah. I could just add to that, I, I've been listening very quietly, but I, I I have to tell you a story. You know Elizabeth Owen Jones' book, and, and her, her, her um, Newbery, or Caldecott book from Prayer for a Child uh, was a wonderful book in that there's a picture of children of many nations, the faces of many nations. And in 1945, nobody portrayed children's faces of many nations. And, and, and Elizabeth told me, I knew her personally, told me a story one time. She did a prayer book with her mother, and she had, in the process of production, she had put a, chi a black child in the front seat of the church pew. And the publisher editor contacted her and said, Elizabeth, you need to take that black child out of the, the image. And she said, no, I don't want to. And he said, you need to take that out of the image. And she said, no, I don't want to. And he said, if you don't take that child out of the image, the book doesn't get published. Mm -hmm. Incredible. So it, it, it's an example. She was a woman way ahead of her day. Yeah. Um, but, but even the, even authors and illustrators had to fight those battles uh, uh, without question and authors and illustrators brought their own their own experiences and their own yeah. prejudices into this yeah. as well you know and and you know i i i also collect um, i can't swing my computer around but i also collect um children's book week posters which were mm -hmm. uh issued for each um, you know, each time a, uh, a noted illustrator, usually a children's uh, illustrator, would be commissioned to create a poster for for a children's book week. And I have one downstairs that's actually a very large, very um, sideways poster done by, I believe, the Petersons, if I'm remembering correctly, that celebrates children's books around the world. And this was, you know, probably 1940s, if I remember, something like that. And they have children in various costumes, uh, national costumes, reading yeah. almost every single child in that illustration has blonde hair, yeah. you know? And you realize that, in, you know, children's books around the world. And uh, yeah. so at any rate, what I want, <laughs> all of this was leading, and thank you, Richard, that was a great, great point, to a book called Our Indians, A Midnight Trip to the Great Somewhere or Other. And this is a book from 1899. The reason that I referenced uh, Longfellow's Song of Hiawatha is that uh, Native Americans, uh, you know, became um, sort of cultural coin after, uh, after Hiawatha. And I'm trying to find some of these illustrations. But it, this has some of the most remarkable chromolithograph illustrations that... Um, oh, wow that I've ever encountered in a children's book. And um, also has just beautiful, beautiful double page illustrations. The basic idea of the book is that an uncle, through his connections with our Indians, is able to uh, take his niece and nephew 
on a remarkable journey to the uh, great somewhere or other where the Native Americans live. And uh, in, in point of fact, I mean, if you read the text, um, the Indians are not portrayed in a terribly uh, negative light. In fact, they're sort of magical creatures more than anything else. But they are stereotypically presented in um, in the uh, in the illustrations, mm -hmm. like so. Like a and, uh, this is an incredible. This is uh, 1899, and one of the interesting things about it, we had talked about uh, by the shores of Gitche Gumi, by the big sea shining water. Um, this entire book has lots of text, and it is all written. I had to look this up in trochaic tetrameter, <laughs> which is exactly the same as the uh, Hiawatha, just to. Uh, now the bard bounds by his bedstand, airy, graceful, grabs her clothing, grabs his dress coat somewhat dusty, and on and on. Just the same, the same uh, as, uh, as uh, the Song of Hiawatha. And then finally, and then I'll get out of your way. Um, well, before, you get the, to the, before you oh, get to course. the final one, uh, you use sure. the term chromolithography, a very yes. common process for producing pictures in the late 19th century and the very early 20th century. I'd like to uh, ask uh, for any of our listeners who aren't familiar with that term, for you or Richard to, or, or, or Lee to, to, to comment on chromolithography as opposed yeah. to the process that was uh, invented a little bit afterwards, lithography, and, and yes. used more commonly today. Yeah, chromolithography, I think, was just the, mo the most beautiful printing method ever. I just love these illustrations. It's a it's an ink-based process, um, an oil ink-based process in which the color actually does not seep into the page per se, but remains on the surface. And you just get these brilliant, brilliant colors. Um, and, you know, lithography was, you know, stone lithography was usually um, you know, a, a step further down the line before, you know, print, what do they call it, with the dots? Um, or, yeah, and my, I know what you mean. Yeah, um, my... Larry, if I could just add sure. one... Of course. One, one little uh, tidbit to what you're saying. The oil process is actually a four-step color process. And each layer had to dry, and then the next color would be laid on, dried, Next, of course, it had, they had to be re-registered in between. And one of the reasons we lost chromolithography, and you're correct, the greatest color print process ever, uh, is because it became too expensive. Absolutely. Uh, because of the cost. But I, I had a, a cloth, a book on Egyptian cloth some 20 years ago, and it was a folio. And every time somebody would open it up, their hands would go to the paper immediately to because your eye saw cloth. Your head knew it was on paper, but your eyes saw such deep dimensions. You were saying to yourself, they put cloth samples in the book. <laughs> just, just amazing. It it is a lovely, lovely process. And as I said, you know, I have mixed feelings about the presentation of certain characters in the book, but it is one of the most beautiful books I've ever seen in terms of the chromolithography. Thank you for and then, sharing. Oh, sure. And then finally, um, you know, everybody has a favorite book, and there are a lot of terrific, terrific children's books out there. But uh, I think that there would be a general consensus that one of their, one of most people's favorite uh, mid-century um, children's books was The Very Hungry Caterpillar by uh, by Eric Carle. Um, had a remarkable impact and the, its use of die cut and holes and whatever was really just, just brilliant. Um, it was published in 1969 and on the 25th anniversary of the publication of The uh, Very Hungry Caterpillar, um, Philomel came out with the 25th edition, uh, anniversary edition of it, which came in this case. I'm going to have to unpack it very carefully. And then finally, uh, 
you get to a lucite case mm. like so that can be opened carefully and the 25th edition, which includes an original drawing by Eric Carl of the Very Hungry Caterpillars signed and dated on the front. And then it is just, you know, it is the story of the Very Hungry Caterpillars. What was, the, what was the edition limitation on that? Uh, 500, 500 copies. Yeah. And so this is is one of them, and dated 1994 when it uh, when it came out. I don't want to flip this up, but yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful book. So those are five of the books that I'll be bringing of a good number uh, down to the uh, Florida Fair, and I'm really, really looking forward to seeing not all only all of you, but also all of those. Customers that I, I, you know, I think this goes true for all of us, which is, you know, the pandemic really opened up a bunch of wonderful opportunities for book dealers. I mean, other ways of selling books were uh, were initiated and that we took advantage of. Um, there was a lot of quiet and a lot of opportunity for me to go through my inventory and to upgrade or downgrade prices and to make sure that things were described properly. But there is absolutely nothing in the world like, like, like a book fair where you have the opportunity to meet other people, to, uh, to share stories, uh, to, to that human contact was really missed during these last couple of years. And I could not be happier that, uh, that I'll be going to Florida again. I'm really looking forward to it. Well, I'm sure the other book dealers and customers are glad to have you when COVID closed some doors it opened some windows, but those doors are open again. And uh, we're glad to see you walking through them, Larry. Thank you. Much appreciated. See you down there. All Look right. Okay, to seeing folks. you, Larry. Yes. Good seeing everybody. Uh, I am going to leave. I do have, have a luncheon date that I've got to get to. So until right. Florida, take care. Here Bye-bye. We go. Here we go. All right. Uh, Lee and uh, Richard, anything you uh, want to comment on before we wrap it up here? Oh, what a wonderful presentation. I can't wait to uh, go through those books when they get there. You better bring them all, I'll tell you. If he doesn't, I'm going <laughs> to be disappointed. Uh, those were great. That one, yeah. an Hungry Hungry Caterpillar, is just outstanding. Yeah. Just, uh, just amazing. And and talking about chromolithographs, I have some wildflower prints from that the book that they were in was in tatters when we purchased it, but it's from 1897. And they, you know, you can almost feel the flowers, you know, the 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 colors of this hundred and twenty five year old prints are just amazing, just amazing, and. It was falling apart, and they had been matted, uh, you know, just to protect the prints. And I don't bring them to book fairs much. I've taken them to antique shows, but they are just so, just so beautiful, just so beautiful. Yeah. Uh, it, it, we don't get that kind of color printing, you know. I mean, we, we have we have good color printing, but it's just different. It just feels different. It looks different. It's so delicious. <laughs> All right, folks. So uh, thanks for joining us for uh, the second 2024 edition of the Rare Book Cafe. Let's all take a sip. I'm with you there, Lee. Mm. You can find us every week on uh, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, or wherever great podcasts are given away for free. That's it, folks. The Rare Book Cafe, the book lovers' rendezvous. Ciao. Our new symbol. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs>